Hello, my name is Brooke Spaeth and I'm from the Flinders University International Centre for Point of Care Testing, jointly with the Community Point of Care Services Unit at Flinders University in South Australia. The aim of this lecture is to provide inter interested students and practising health professionals with an overview of the field of point of care testing for malaria, with particular reference to low resource settings. Slide 2. During this lecture I will discuss what is point of care testing, then I will go on to some statistics on the prevalence of malaria as well as some other facts. I will also discuss the current methods for diagnosing malaria. Then specifically I will be talking about malaria rapid diagnostic tests or RDTs and the various considerations for using RDTs in low resource settings. I will also discuss the importance of operator training and quality testing for rapid diagnostic tests, as well as diagnosis and treatment plans for results. Lastly, I will provide you with a few examples of some good quality RDTs that are currently available. Slide 3. So firstly, what is point of care testing? It is a pathology test that is performed on a small portable medical device outside of the laboratory setting by a trained operator. Point of care testing only requires a small sample volume and is performed during the time of the patient consultation with results immediately available, leading to prompt treatment and therefore an improved outcome for the patient. Slide 4. The most significant advantage of point of care testing is a decrease in turnaround times for the test result, from hours or days for most laboratory testing to less than 20 minutes for most point of care tests. This means that results are immediately available at the time the health professional consults with the patient, which leads to immediate intervention for the patient and therefore there is no time delay in treatment and no need for a follow-up visit to receive results. Slide 5. Malaria is endemic in over 90 countries with around half the world's population at risk of infection and those living in the poorest countries are the most vulnerable to malaria infection. Currently 300 to 500 million individuals are infected with malaria worldwide and 1.5 to 1.7 million of these people die each year with around 90% of deaths occurring in Africa. Slide 6. There are four common species of malaria that infect humans. These are Plasmodium falciparum, which causes the majority of deaths, Plasmodium vivax, which is the next most common species, Plasmodium malariae, which is sporadically dis distributed in endemic areas, and Plasmodium ovale, which is mainly confined to selected locations such as Central West Africa and the South Pacific Islands. There is also a rare fifth species of malaria that infects certain species of monkeys but is starting to infect humans in small numbers. This species is known as Plasmodium nolesi. Slide 7. The World Health Organization has categorised areas of re relative prevalence of the different malaria species according to zones. Zone 1 includes Sub-Saharan Africa and lowland Papua New Guinea and the species of malaria predominantly found in this zone are fasciparum only or other non-fasciparum occurring, always as co-infections with fasciparum. Zone 2 includes Asia, the Americas and isolated areas of Africa and the species of malaria in, in these areas are any of the four species but most commonly occur as single species infections. Zone 3 includes Central and East Asia and some highland areas in other countries and these areas only experience non-falciparum malaria infections. As you can see, these zonings make it easy to decide what species of malaria you wish to detect and hence, as you will see later, the type of RDT device needed. Slide 8. It has been found that the early detection and effective treatment of malaria can shorten the duration of infection and prevent further complications, including a majority of deaths. In some situations, anti-malarial drugs are given to those thought, but not proven, to be infected with malaria. 
This is because diagnosis is sometimes too difficult and without knowing for certain if the person has malaria, it is safer to treat the patient rather than, rather than to wait for a diagnosis to be made. This blanket treatment of malaria has con contributed to the widespread resistance to antimalarial drugs, which has resulted in rising rates of sickness and death. Point of care testing may offer a quicker and more accessible means of diagnosing malaria infection, leading to early treatment while lowering the indiscriminate use of antimalarial drugs in populations with large numbers of suspected malaria infections. Slide 9. There are several options for diagnosing malaria. The gold standard for laboratory confirmation is microscopy which identifies malaria parasites using a drop of blood from the patient, which is then smeared onto a slide, stained and viewed under a microscope. This technique depends on variables such as the quality of the reagents and the microscope, microscope used, and the experience of the laboratory technician. Diagnosis of malaria using polymerase chain reaction, or PCR, testing is more sensitive technique than microscopy as it detects nucleic acids from the malaria parasite. However, PCR is often too slow for diagnosis of malaria and too expensive for use in developing countries. PCR is most useful co for confirming the species of malaria parasite after diagnosis has been established. One of the newest ways of detecting malaria infection is rapid diagnostic testing. Rapid Diagnostic tests provide a simple platform for on-site point-of-care testing with results available in 2 to 20 minutes. This is therefore offers a convenient and accessible alternative to microscopy where such services are unavailable. Slide 10. The World Health Organization supports the use of RDTs. They have stated that the misdiagnosis of malaria results in significant morbidity and mortality. Rapid, accurate and accessible detection of malaria parasites has an important role in addressing this and in promoting the more rational use of increasingly costly drugs in many endemic areas. Rapid diagnostic tests offer the potential to provide accurate diagnosis to all at-risk populations for the first time, reaching those unable to ac access good, good quality microscopy services. Slide 11. So let's look a little more closely at how malaria RDTs work. Most malaria RDTs de detect specific antigens produced by malaria parasites through a method called immunochromatography. In simple terms, the blood sample is added to the sample well of the RDT. If malaria antigens are present in the in the blood sample, they bind to a conjugated material which usually includes an anti-malarial antibody labelled with the dye. This antigen conjugate complex and flows along the nitrocellulose strip via capillary action. The antigen conjugate complex is captured by immobilised antibodies specific for particular ma malaria antigens and a coloured line is formed. Some RDTs only detect one antigen specific to one or all species of malaria, while others detect a combination of antigens specific to differentiate between the species of malaria. Differentiating between species of malaria can be particularly important, for instance, if a person is infected with Plasmodium falciparum species it is not detected within 24 hours of infection, it is more likely the infection may pro to severe illness often leading to death, whereas if a person is infected with one of the other species of malaria, the situation may not be as serious. Slide 12. The most common antigens that RDTs detect are histidine-rich protein 2, or HRP2, which is specific to Plasmodium falciparum. The next is parasite-specific lactate dehydrogenase, or PLDH, which can be specific to the four species of malaria or can be pan-specific, meaning it can detect any species of malaria. And lastly, aldolase, which is also pan-specific and will detect any species of malaria. 
PLDH and Adelaide's are unique in the fact that they do not stay in the blood for long but clear around the same time as the parasites following successful treatment and can therefore be useful in predict predicting treatment failure. Slide 13. Here you can see an illustration of the life cycle of the malaria parasite and where the different types of antigens can be detected during this cycle. Firstly, the person is bitten by the mosquito, which injects the malaria parasites into the bloodstream. These then travel to the, to the liver and invade liver cells. Then over a few days, depending on the species of malaria, the parasites grow, divide and produce thousands of merozoites. In some malaria species, these can remain dormant for extended periods in the liver, causing relapses weeks or months later. These then re-enter the bloodstream, beginning a cycle of invading red blood cells, replication and then release of newly formed merozoites repeatedly over approximately one to three days, depending on the species of malaria. This can result in thousands of parasite infected cells in the bloodstream, leading to illness and complications of malaria that can last for months if not treated. It is this point where parasite infected cells are released into the bloodstream that the antigens can be detected. Some of the merozoites may develop into gametocytes, which if passed on to another human via another mosquito can transmit the malaria infection. Slide 14. There are three types of RDT devices. The cheapest is the dipstick, which works by placing the nitrocellulose strip into a well containing the blub. And as mentioned previously, if the malaria parasite is present in the blood, conjugated antigen will attach to the immobilised antibody in the strip and a colour change will occur. Dipsticks are often more prone to operator error because they rely on the operator being able to read the colour change in the correct area, which can sometimes be difficult to see as there are no markings to indicate where the reading window is and where to look for the line. The line can also som sometimes be quite faint, which can but still indicate a malaria infection. Cassettes or cards provide an easier means of interpreting results as the nitrocellulose strip is incorporated into a cassette or card which has designated a reading window. For this reason they are also more expensive. Slide 15. When selecting a malaria RDT, other things that need to be considered are the shelf life or expiry date, which should ideally be 18 months or more. The storage temperature and temperature stability, which should ideally be up to 40 degrees Celsius to ensure that the safe transport of RDTs is possible. The ease of use and interpretation of results of the RDT and also the cost of the RDT, its delivery and any other materials or consumables needed to conduct testing should be considered because although some RDTs may be cheaper than others, they may, they may require additional equipment such as lancets or capillaries that will increase the cost per test. Some manufacturers will have their own quality testing materials available to support field testing, but if they do not supply quality testing material, then it will have to be sourced elsewhere and trialled for its compatibility with the RDT. And we will return to quality testing shortly. So how do I select the best device available? This is when information on the performance characteristics of the device must be sourced and evaluated before deciding on a preferred device. To access performance characteristics, I firstly need to introduce the terms of sensitivity and specificity to you, particularly if you are using the device for the detection of malaria infection. Slide 16. Sensitivity is the number of true positive results in patients infected with malaria. For example, if the sensitivity of a device was 95% and we tested 100 malaria positive patients, 95 out of the 100 patients would give a positive result, i.e. the patient is truly positive for malaria infection and the remaining 5 out of 100 results would be false negative results, meaning that the patient was infected with malaria, but the test came back negative. 
RDT sensitivity can be affected by many factors, such as the species of parasite, the number of parasites present or the parasite density, the condition of the device, the correctness of technique used by the operator, the parasite viability and the variation in antigen structure and expression. Slide 17. Specificity is the number of true negative results in malaria negative patients. For example, if the specificity of malaria RDT tests was 99%, then 99 of the 100 malaria negative patients tested would return a negative test result, whilst the remaining malaria negative patients would return a false positive result meaning that the test incorrectly suggests that they have a malaria infection when really they are malaria negative. It can be considered that sensitivity rather than specificity is more important in detecting malaria infections as the consequences of false negative result, results are much greater than false positive results. This is because false negative result may mean the patient may not receive the treatment he or she requires and if left untreated particularly with fastiprim infections, the patient may die as a consequence. The World Health Organization has recommended that at least 95% of plasmodium fastiprim infections should be detected at parasite densities of 100 parasites per microliter and above, which is similar to what microscopy can achieve. Ideally, the sensitivity and specificity of the RDT should be researched using reliable published articles with well-designed trials of the device and not taken straight from the manufacturer package insert. As often, the manufacturer may have only done a trial on a small number of samples in a controlled environment. Also, the prevalence of malaria infection in a population can often alter the sensitivity and specificity of the RDT and it may perform differently in real life settings. Slide 18. What can cause false negative or false positive results when using malaria RDTs? The possible reasons for a false negative may be that the parasite density was too low to register a positive result for example, below 100 parasites per microliter. RDTs may be damaged by heat and humidity and should therefore not be taken out of the sealed package until just before use. Or the patient may have been infected with a species of malaria that is not detected by malaria RDT being used. There are also reasons for a false positive result. For example, the RDT may detect antigens in the blood after the parasites have been eliminated through a course of antimalarial medication. The HRP2 antigen can remain in the blood for up to 14 days after malaria parasites have been killed by the drugs. In this case, a positive RDT may, result, may be misleading. PLDH and Adelaide disappear from the blood more rap rapidly and so will usually be negative after a few days after effective treatment. Other substances in the blood, such as rheumatoid factor, may cause a false positive result. As you can see, the possibility of false positives and false negative results emphasise the need to carefully look at the patient's clinical presentation, and the RDT results should be interpreted with, in conjunction with the clinical picture. Slide 19. When setting up field testing using RDT selected, things that must be considered prior to the commencement of patient testing include training should be conducted for all operators in the use of an interpretation of the results, storage condi conditions of the RDT must be continually monitored and adhered to, a form or quality testing process should be in place, blood safety precautions should be strictly followed, and the most important consideration is that there must be a clear management plan for all patient results. As point of care testing is most effective when testing is linked to a clearly defined clinical pathway. So now, now I will go on to these considerations in a little more detail. Slide 20. As already mentioned, it is critical that the person that is performing the point of care test has been trained and has passed a competency assessment just the same way as operators in the laboratory devices and instruments are required to do. 
Often this can be achieved by using the manufacturer's training program if one is available. However, in some instances additional training material for a tailored training program may be required. If possible, a range of culturally appropriate training resources tailored to specific low resource settings should be developed. These may include a detailed training menu, manual, large coloured posters as step-by-step -step guides with pictures and instructions on how to perform a test, just like the one you can see here. Also a DVD showing the real life demonstration of how a test is performed may be useful. There should also be a defined competency assessment procedure with a theoretical and a practical component for operators to pass before obtaining a competency certificate. It is also recommended that each qualified operator is recorded in a competency register and the operator is required to repeat training once their competency expires, for example every 12, 12 months or 2 years. During training, the operators of the RDTs should also be monitored for their skills in interpretation, test preparation, technique and interpretation of results. For example, using pictures of various combinations of test results to test if the operator can interpret them correctly. Slide 21. It is important that RDTs are quality tested throughout the life of the kits to ensure their reliability and stability. At least one quality control test should be performed upon arrival of every lot, new lot number of RDT and also when RDTs are getting close to their expiry date. An extensive guide on quality testing for malaria RDTs can be found at the World Health Organization website. Slide 22. As mentioned earlier, while the use of RDTs can be used to assist in the diagnosis of malaria infection, RDTs should not be used as a standalone tool for diagnosis. The patient's presentation, examination and history should also be taken into account to ensure the most accurate diagnosis is made. Once a diagnosis has been made, it is critical to have a clear treatment plan for the patient. Where a skilled clinical assessment is not available, a treatment algorithm may be useful and this can be developed using the guidance of malaria specialist before the program using RDTs has commenced. Some good examples of malaria diagnosis and treatment algorithms can be found at the websites listed here. However, there are still some cases which all patients with fever should be treated for malaria. One such case is children under 5 years of age in areas with high malaria prevalence. Since Plasmodium falciparum malaria infection can lead to rapid death in young children and RDT results can sometimes be misleading, the World Health Organization continues to recommend presumptive treatment for under 5s in higher malaria prevalence areas. Slide 23. So now I'll give you, give you a few examples of some RDTs that satisfy a majority of the selection criteria for RDTs that have been discussed. Slide 24. The Binax Now Malaria RDT is a card technology which can differentiate between Plasmodium falciparum and mixed infections of all four species. It is a shelf life of more than 12 months and a storage temperature range between 2 and 37 degrees Celsius and a single test takes 15 minutes to complete. The sensitivity for, for Plasmodium falciparum was 90% or greater for different parasite loads. Also there have been studies to indicate that there are no difference between finger prick and venous results and currently the Binax Now Malaria Kit is the only RDT kit to be FDA approved. Slide 25. The SD BioLine Malaria RDT is a cassette technology that can differentiate between Plasmodium falciparum and Plasmodium vivax. It is a long shelf life of up to 24 months and a storage temperature of between 1 and 40 degrees Celsius. In round 3, testing by the World Health Organization, the SD BioLine kit sensitivity for both Plasmodium falciparum and Plasmodium vivax was 95% or greater for different parasite loads. Slide 26. 
The Care Start Malaria Kit is a cassette-based rapid diagnostic test for Plasmodium falciparum and Plasmodium vivax with a time to result of 20 minutes. It also has a long shelf life of up to 24 months and can be stored between 4 and 30 degrees according to the manufacturer. However, other studies have found that the stability is not affected when stored at up to 45 degrees for 90 days. The sensitivity for Plasmodium falciparum and Plasmodium vivax was 90% or greater for different parasite densities. Slide 27. The first response malaria RDT is a cassette technology that also tests for Plasmodium falciparum only with results available in 20 minutes. It also has a shelf life of up to 24 months and can be stored between 4 and 35 degrees Celsius. In round 3 testing by the World Health Organization, the sensitivity for Plasmodium falciparum was 100% for different parasite loads. Slide 28. For more information about our point of care testing programs or point of care testing in general, please visit our websites as listed here. Slide 29. We would like to thank Professor Gerald Cost, Director of Clinical Chemistry, San Francisco School of Medicine, for giving us the opportunity to develop this series of lectures. And to Associate Professor Mark Shepard, Director of the Flinders University International Centre for Point of Care Testing and the Community Point of Care Services Unit for assisting in the preparation of these lectures. Thank you.